Hi guys, um, welcome to your brain lecture. Let's get going. All right, usually um, this is what people think of brain when you say brain, and um, people usually think of the cerebrum when we give a lecture on the brain. So let, let's start with that. The cerebrum is this wrinkly um, part of the brain. And uh, what we learned today is that we have two brains, the right and left cerebral hemispheres. So, let's go to that. Quote unquote brain is people usually thinking of the cerebrum. We got two of them. So the cerebral hemispheres are the cerebral, right and left. Left cerebral hemisphere. There's something called a cerebral dominance. Um, for example, your left brain, left cerebral hemisphere, it controls the right side of your body and vice versa. Uh, the right brain controls your left side of the body. And so um, the, the left cerebral hemisphere um, that's usually the one that's dominant 90% of the time. So the idea of cerebral dominance means, um, well, for example, the left cerebral hemisphere is usually the dominant one 90% of the time. For example, most of those people are righties, right-handed, or right-handed, I'm left-handed. Um, 90% of the time, you know, varieties. Now, it turns out um, there's a division of labor between left and right hemisphere. And the left one, um, you know, that's for language. Um, math, logic uh, tend to be um, the tasks for the left brain. Language. So basically, your left brain speaks. So if we cut the picture, cut the brain in half, um, right down the middle, then you can see the other half, um, the right cerebral hemisphere. If you hear my family in the background, well, you know, they're, they're home, uh, as we all are, so, you know, uh, part of the background noise, but just try to focus on the words that are coming out of my mouth, okay? So, right cerebral hemisphere. So, if, if this is the brain that's dominant, about 10% of the time, you're probably a lefty or ambidextrous. Dominant 10% of the time, or as in, like I have, lefties. Or you could be ambidextrous. The division of labor for this brain is usually more visual, spatial, artistic. Um, what else did they say? Musical, things like that. Visual, spatial, artistic, or musical. Now your two brains are in communication via this structure right here, the corpus callosum, which means thickened body. It has um, pathways that allow left and right to talk to each other so that your two brains function as one. The 
corpus callosum is one of many things that we call commissures in the brain. They allow the gray matter um, to communicate to different parts of the brain. So this commissure, the corpus callosum, allows the two hemispheres to talk to each other. So I'll describe it as a commissure. that allows the two cerebral hemispheres to talk to each other, to communicate. A commissure that allows the two cerebral hemispheres to communicate. So basically you learn that you've got two brains and um, this, these cerebral hemispheres, they're each organized into four functional lobes shown here, parietal, occipital, temporal, and frontal. Also, if you cut the brain down this frontal plane and look at it right here, we can see that it's, it's the, again, the outer part of the cerebral cortex that's the gray matter, okay? Uh, and then you have inner white matter. Remember, it's flipped in the spinal cord. The inner matter was the gray matter, and the outer matter was the white matter. But it flips by the time you get to the brain here, okay? And also, we see that the wrinkly appearance, these raised ridges, are called um, gyri, that word there. And that these uh, deep grooves here are called sulci. So you got gyri and sulci, and you have deeper grooves that are called fissures. So let me um, note this for you. So first thing, cerebral hemispheres arranged into four functional lobes. Frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal. And these four lobes of the brain are, are named after the um, cranial bones that cover them in the skull. Named after the cranial bones that cover them. Sorry, that was my son knocking on the door. But I just wanted to give you time to copy that. Okay, again, um, the raised ridges are called gyri.
And uh, these grooves are called salsa. The deeper groove is a fissure, shown here. Pulled together, the gyri, the sulci, the fissures, um, they give the, the cerebrum that wrinkled appearance, which is good. Wrinkled is good. It means you have more surface area. It's not smooth and flat. Your brain, the quote-unquote wrinkled appearance. Let's start to talk about some of the, the functions of these um, lobes. frontal lobe, that's basically your conscious self. Your personality lies in that part of your lobe, covered by the frontal lobe. Conscious self, personality. There's also um, a lot of important motor functions there, like an area of motor speech. Motor speech is like when you talk out loud, all the things that have to happen, you know, the, the formation of the, the words that come out of your mouth are shaped by the tongue, your mouth, your lips moving. There's a lot of things happening in motor speech. But also just motor function in general, controlling your whole body. Um, part of the frontal lobe, as we'll see, um, has your primary motor cortex where you can move your whole body. Primary, that means primary. Cortex. And we'll look at more motor areas later. This is just an overview. Parietal lobe. Well, the parietal lobe, that actually has your primary sensory cortex for feeling. Your primary motor cortex, move your whole body. The primary sensory cortex, you feel your whole body. Okay, that's basically it. Occipital lobe. Basically, occipital lobe back here um, is for vision. That's why if you fall at the back of your head, you see stars. Your visual cortex, occipital lobe. Temporal lobe, that's, uh, there's a lot of things going on there. That's for hearing, um, smelling or olfaction, uh, taste, <clears throat> taste is routed there, and also memory, 
lie in the temporal lobe. Uh, temporal lobe, excuse me. Okay, let's move on. So in this picture, again, we have more uh, color code, and we have those four functional lobes. And um, what to categorize um, other things? We have motor, sensory, and association areas, uh, which comprise most of these different types of functions. For example, visual, that's sensory. These are all sensory, okay? So think of it that way too. These functions can be categorized into motor sensory or what's called association areas. And let me start with association area. Association areas lie just outside of the, the primary functional areas. For example, the occipital lobe is your visual cortex, but the primary visual center is right here, the dark blue. The association area lie right outside the primary cortex area. Okay. So anatomically, that's what they are. Association areas lie just outside the primary cortex areas. And they basically communicate with the primary cortex areas to help you make sense of the world, as I'll show you soon. I want to show you the, the primary motor cortex here. It's the pre-central gyrus. Again, I usually use red for motor, blue for sensory. So, it's called the pre-central gyrus. Remember, the raised ridges are gyri, gyrus is singular. So the pre-central gyrus is your primary motor cortex. Right there, all of that. central gyrus right here is your primary sensory cortex And in between them is a groove called the central sulcus. The interesting thing is that Pre-central gyrus, okay, viewed here, the outer gray area, they color it red. And the post-central gyrus, your sensory cortex, they're arranged into topographical maps. Um, that'll, so, for example, um, this area of cortex controls your thumb and hand. Okay, so let me write that down. So both of these our, our cortex arranged into topographical maps. The cortex is arranged into topographical 
geographical maps. For example, this area is where you feel your face. You have area of cortex devoted to certain body parts. It's a map of your whole body onto your cortex. So you either feel your body or you control your body. You control your body by moving your muscles. You feel your body because the dermatomes have nerve endings that help you feel. Now if you were to take this, um, all these body parts and arrange them into a person, you get a disproportionate figurine called homunculus. So what we learned from homunculus, this guy right there, or girl, or person, Homunculus represents the disproportionate amount of cortex devoted to certain body parts. It represents the disproportionate area of cortex, area of cerebral cortex, Cortex means bark, the outer part, like the bark of a tree. The disproportionate area of cerebral cortex devoted to different areas of the body. from just looking at homunculus is you have more cortical area devoted to your hands and lips, for example. That makes sense, so that you have more feeling and more uh, motor control. So like playing, playing the piano, maybe you can hear my daughter practicing the piano now, so there's more fine touch. So you have more cortex devoted to those regions that are more sensitive and personal, like your face, okay? Your, like your hands and feet are very personal parts of your body. More motor areas shown here. Again, most of these areas are in your uh, frontal lobe. You have the primary motor cortex, which I just got through saying is the pre-central gyrus. Now the premotor cortex is like the association area for the primary motor cortex. That's kind of where you, you plan or think about movements. There are other areas of the brain that are for planning, coordinating, and integrating information for movements, but this is one of them. Uh, frontal eye field is for moving your eyeballs. Um, I don't talk about that one too much, but Broca's area, I do. So this area of your brain, like I said, is for motor speech. Let's write that one down. Which is pretty much the act of speaking out loud. And then prefrontal cortex. This area is uh, well, pretty much like I said where you have your area of personality and conscious self. This is where um, you do some of your deep thinking. Like um, when you're grossed in thought, you just hmm, you think like that, you touch that area of your brain, you furrow your brow. Uh, so let's just say thinking. This is your thinking brain. Here's some sensory areas. We talked about somatic sensation right here. 
This is your primary sensory cortex, and right out there would be the association area. We have taste. I'll write down Wernicke's area. That's the area of language comprehension. Always know Broca's and Wernicke's. Don't confuse them. I just erased Broca's. I'll write it again. Broca's area of motor speech and Wernicke's area. That's language comprehension. Motor speech is like reading out loud. Language comprehension is understanding the words you're reading. So for example, just reading silently. That's language comprehension. But then reading out loud, that's also Broca's area. I like when you get those instructions out and they're in many different languages, you just kind of look. Don't understand that, don't understand that. Oh, I understand that. That's language comprehension. And language is important for humans. We use language unlike any other animal, okay? So that kind of distinguishes us from lesser animals, I guess. Now, I already talked about vision and hearing. Uh, well, let's move on. This next slide shows you what is meant by association areas. There are large areas of cortex that lie outside the primary areas in close proximity. The main function is to integrate diverse information for purposeful action. So for example, you see a red light. Which part of the brain will be activated in response to, the, to seeing this stimuli? What will be that? Okay. And then what would the correct response be? The association area would say, okay, I'm driving the car. I see a red light. I stop. Okay, I hit the brake. Uh, that's the purposeful action. But like every time you see a red light, do you hit the brake? Well, only if it's the stop light. Um, would you hit the brake if you're in the passenger seat and you're not driving? Well, no. So this is what we're talking about. Association areas, you see the red light, you hit the brakes if you're the one driving, etc. Okay, to help you make sense of the world. Uh, you integrate information for purposeful action. The primary cortex allows you to see red light, but the association area puts everything in context. You're not disoriented, right? Here's some questions for you. Define homunculus. Again, that's the disproportionate um, person that represents different cortical areas that correspond to different body parts. The pre-essential gyrus is motor function. The post-essential gyrus is sensory function. The central sulcus is in the frontal or coronal plane. Let's go back and take a quick peek at that. pre and post uh, gyrus and um, the central sulcus right down here. This is the frontal or coronal plane. The area of motor speech, 
That's Broca's area. Again, don't confuse it with language comprehension. That's Wernicke's area. The lobes of the brain are named after the cranial bones that cover them. For example, the occipital bone covers the occipital lobe of the brain. The outer cerebral cortex is gray matter. Moving on, brain regions. We've been talking about mostly the cerebral hemispheres and the uh, cerebral cortex, but there's other divisions of the brain. So number one is what we've been talking about, brain or cerebral, uh, cerebrum. divisions of the CNS. So number one, your brain or cerebral, right? People like, you say, oh, that guy, he's really cerebral. I mean, he's very um, deep in thought, um, cerebral. Your brains. That's all I've talked about so far. But the other divisions I will talk about, number two, call that the the diencephalon. Di means two, as we'll see, there are two of them in there. Uh, but because this is half a brain, you see one. Number three, midbrain. Number four, Pawns. Because uh, four and five are kind of at the same level, I'll put five right next to it. That's the cerebellum, not to be confused with cerebrum. Number six, medulla. The full name is medulla oblongata. to the medulla is the spinal cord which is not shown also part of the CNS and I already talked about it so I won't I didn't put it on this figure but those are the basic divisions of the CNS minus spinal cord so to talk about the, um, the basic functions of these different divisions I'm sorry on the previous slide that one was unnumbered but I did talk about it before this is Corpus callosum. Corpse, that means body. Callosum is a thickening. Like a callus on your hand, thickening. Thickened body. But we had said earlier, it's a bridge of white matter connecting the two hemispheres, allowing them to communicate as a whole. So your two brains function as one. Let's talk about the, the diencephalon, which has different parts here that I've numbered. Okay. 
So number one is pointing to this area here. That's the thalamus. Think of the thalamus as a sensory switchboard. It's formed from those third order neurons, the cell bodies of third order neurons. Remember we talked about the sensory pathway? First order, second order, third order. This is formed from the cell bodies of third order neurons. Formed by cell bodies of third order neurons, okay? So, um, they'll just, it just routes the, the incoming information to the correct part of the brain. For example, routes sense of touch to the correct part of your primary sensory cortex. Touch, incoming touch feelings to correct part of your primary sensory cortex. Maybe it'll route hearing to the temporal lobe. Or maybe it'll route visual inputs to the occipital lobe. No, not yet, Andrew. I'm oh, sorry, my son's trying to get in here. I better hurry up. Uh, let's see. All right, well, anyways, the thalamus. Number two is the intermediate mass of the thalamus. Let me show you the next slide. We're still on diencephalon. right there is right there. So here is um, a posterior view. If you take right there, the diencephalon right there, it's right there, a little purple part. If you remove that out, um, you have the thalamus. If you cut right there, the blue arrow, blue arrow, that's the intermediate mass of the thalamus, basically holding the two thalamus together. I'm just saying it's between the two thalamus. Going back to that picture, number three, this area of the diencephalon is called hypothalamus. It's primarily for endocrine function. Endocrine function is um, for hormonal control of your body. I'll, 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 we have a whole chapter on endocrine later on. But anyways, endocrine function, it controls endocrine function because it um, directly or indirectly controls number four, the pituitary. Controls 
controls the pituitary gland. Number four on the figure. So those are the areas of thalamus, diencephalon, and white neuter. So diencephalon includes thalamus, hypothalamus, um, pretty much. Here's another picture of the thalamus. The red arrows are pointing to it. And let's move on down to the midbrain. Now one thing I didn't mention before is that the midbrain, pons, medulla, those are considered the brain stem anatomically. You should note that. Midbrain, pons, medulla, anatomically, brain stem. Okay. Well, anyways, here are, here's what I want you to know for the midbrain. It has cerebral peduncles and corpora quadrigemina. Here are the cerebral peduncles, which means kind of like feet. They kind of like hold up the cerebrum here and here. The cerebral peduncles contain cortical spinal tracts. So it's on midbrain. Contain cerebral peduncles, that's the name of the structure. And those cerebral peduncles, within them, they are composed of cortical spinal tracts. These tracts are motor tracts that go from Cortex, cortical means cortex, like your primary motor cortex, and they shoot that information down, motor command, to the spinal cord. So these tracks, because they do that, are motor and function. They can get the information from your brain down to your spinal cord so it can go out to the correct nerves to move your muscles. Okay, you also have within part of the midbrain is this corpora quadrigemina. That means body, that means four. So basically it means four bodies or quadruplets. So you got four. You got two superior, two inferior colliculi or colliculus, singular, but you got two superior. That's colliculi. And you have two inferior. So you can see them on the posterior view of the brain stem right here. That's the diencephalon. But then below that, green brain stem. So the superior colliculi, those are for uh, visual reflexes. Like for example, when the dot sh shines a pen light, just watch, watch the light and you just track it with your eyeballs. 
Again, that kind of visual thing. Um, Ball tracking, watch the watch the light. For the inferior colliculi, those are for auditory relays. Like uh, the startle reflex is a good example. Like if you hear a loud sound and you, oh my gosh, that that will be the normal reaction. But if like you see a person and there's a loud sound and you just kind of sit there deadpan, that could indicate midbrain dysfunction. Startle reflex. Okay. Anatomically, part of the midbrain. Let's move on. So this figure is fully labeled here. So if you wanted to study the whole thing, you could. Moving on, we got pons medulla. Pons is often described as a bridge. It contains a large number of neurons that connect pathways from cerebrum to cerebellum, because it's right there in the middle. So it connects those two things. It contains a large number of neurons connecting cerebrum cerebellum. Medulla, it's important, it contains centers that control um, cardiovascular function and respiratory function. So let me put that for medulla. Actually, with the pons, it, it helps control cardiorespiratory functions. Together with pons, has cardiorespiratory function. Then you have what's called the, the behind brain, the cerebellum. Cerebellum, in a nutshell, helps you execute movements. The cerebellum receives inputs from spinal cord, cerebral cortex, and balance your inner ear. So it's able to integrate and um, all that information so you have the, the correct output to execute the movement. It coordinates the planning, timing, and patterning of skeletal muscle movements during the movement. Okay, so for example, me reaching out and just grabbing my coffee cup, picking it up, that was all planned, timed, and coordinated, and take a drink. Cellular function, so um, it's good to understand this is receiving input from all those things. Inputs from spinal cord, Cortex, 
that's sensory and motor, as well as balance. Those all go cerebellum. And the cerebellum integrates that, executes movements. Okay. A good example of that is, um, well, for example, alcohol can cause what's called cerebellum ataxia. Drink, drink it. Ataxia means um, impaired movement. That's why in the sobriety test, um, the police officer asks you to close your eyes and you know touch there, do that. If you can't do that, oh god, yeah. you might be drunk or you know what's that? Walk along a straight line. Put one foot in front of the other and walk along a straight line. If you can't do it, you're staggering. cerebellar ataxia. So there's a lot of um, white matter inside there. And it looks like a tree. So one anatomy thing I want you to know, when you cut the cere cerebellum open, note the arbor vitae, it means tree of life. Okay, it just describes the white matter, its appearance inside the cerebellum. So here's some questions for you. Try to go over these real quick. Number one, the structure allows communication between right and left cerebral hemispheres, corpus callosum. The structure that contains corticospinal tracts, cerebral peduncles, remember that's of the midbrain. The function of superior colliculi, uh, visual relays like following a pen light with your eyeball, just tracking that movement. Inferior colliculi like auditory relays like the startle reflex. The bridge between the cerebral cortex and cere cerebellum is the pons. The medulla primarily contains the cardiorespiratory centers. The thalamus acts as a sensory switchboard, and it's the hypothalamus that um, has the endocrine function because it controls the pituitary. As you can hear, my sons were pounding, trying to get in the room, so I better stop. And this is, you know, this is usually where they watch TV. So uh, this is brain part one. We're done. Be ready for brain part two, which will um, come soon.